73, that though my heart and my body may fail me, that he, that God is our strength and our portion. And I'm going to ask you to rise and sing with me the songs they call Made Me Glad. God has made me glad. Our deliverer, our strength, our portion, our high, our strong tower.
are so, so grateful that you are here, that you are here in this moment, in this time, in this church community, this family of faith. So I ask blessings upon this, our gathering, as we are here to worship, we are here to learn, we are here to praise, to pray, to be in communion with you. So I ask blessings upon us, upon our time, that we might indeed open our hearts and open our minds to receive all that you are to give to us this day. I ask this in your precious and holy name, in the name of Jesus, our brother and savior in Christ. Amen and amen. Please be seated and welcome everyone. Looks like you made it. <laughs> We all survived, uh, sur survived surviving last week. <laughs> there was uh, lots of great memes that were going around. My pastor friends were sending around about what pastors felt like on uh, Easter Eve, and I could so relate. I could relate on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. But you know, God is with us and still with us, and so we gather again today. So a huge welcome to each and every one of you. And it looks like, has everyone been here at least once before? Yeah, once or twice for you. Um, good, so let's welcome us this morning. You know what to do with our prayer cards, with our welcome cards, the update cards, and our envelopes. There, I've said it, now you know what to do. <laughs> Just call your attention, but I also, uh, in, all, in all seriousness, call your attention to our bulletin. Just a few announcements we have uh, for you today. Uh, I want to remind folks that tomorrow night is uh, storytelling time, story storytelling workshop. I'd like you to see Gil Dawson if you are interested. It meets here at 7.30. Uh, and you know, everyone has a story and it's a time to share, sto share your story. Um, with one another and you know when we learn each other's stories it's a way of making connections and to uh, build relationships so I encourage you to talk with uh, Gil afterwards and he can give you all of the information uh, we of course still have choir practice every Thursday 730 please see Michael uh, if you would like to attend uh, chat with Pat is still going to be on hiatus for a few more months I'll let you know when uh, that picks back up again and we have two meetings that we have, of course, our board meeting today, but we have our congregational meeting coming up on uh, May 6th. So we'll be sending you more information about that, um, but put that on your calendar and make sure you're here and we'll uh, have some a good time had by all. I also want to, after church, if you have the time, if when you have your coffee and cookie or snack, take the time to go out and, and, and be on our patio as well as in our fellowship hall. It's been lots of great work that's been done to it and is continuing to be done to it. I, uh, while they are not here, I want to acknowledge Wayne and Dee for all of their hard work. I, I heard that there, it looks like there's gonna be Valley Pride uh, in August, and if indeed that is the case, we were thinking what a great way to um, share ourselves and have a, have a uh, party for, for the community and show off our garden. Um, by having a pride party uh, here. So just keep your ears peeled for that and all the information that'll come forth. So with that, let's turn to one another and welcome each other here this morning. <laughs>
So this is what happens when I do announcements and I don't look at my notes. <laughs> I did forget one or two things. I thought I was done quickly. Um, I want to uh, let folks know if anybody would like to bring lilies home, please do so. Um, some of you did, but we, there are extras, so please feel free to bring those home. I also want to acknowledge and lift up those who celebrate Greek Orthodox Easter, for that is today, um, for Joel and others who that is, uh, is it also a celebration. And I, the last thing I want to do, and most importantly, there's birthdays this month. We didn't do it last week because we kind of had a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but I want to acknowledge John McDonald, Vanessa Roca, um, Casey Slack, and Chrissy Acker Thompson. Um, their birthdays are all this month. And if you have a birthday this month that I did not acknowledge, please let me know later so that I can make sure it gets on our calendar. Um, uh, Casey, as you know, uh, the woman with a woman in blue uh, is who sits back there. Usually she is. Uh, just to let everyone know and to acknowledge her, um, she is uh, at a, a Unitarian Church this week preaching because she has been approved for ordination with the Unitarian Church. So um, you can congratulate her next week. Um, but anyway, uh, if we could, let's sing uh, to those that even though they're not here, we're going to put it out into the, into the world. A happy birthday <coughs> to all of these. Happy birthday to you. Our reading today is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29 from the message. Listen to what the Spirit has for you today. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the Master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greeting, peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them, receive the Holy Spirit, he said. And if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes, and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. <coughs> then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. This ends our reading. May God open these words to our hearts and to our minds. So this morning, as I come with the opportunity to sing for you, I come with great memories of this song. This first time I heard this song, it must have been 10 or 11 years old. And then in John and my relationship uh, with his family, uh, we got an urgent call that Dad Sanchez uh, was passing. And so we all rushed from where we were, uh, John, myself, and our three boys, uh, Tommy, Mikey, and Alex to join the rest of the family to be by his side. Now, because of uh, our, the apostolic background that they came from, uh, we sat and we sang songs of praise and of hymns and uh, in honor of his life in, uh, as a dad, as a grandfather, as a friend, a husband. And um, the only way that I could describe it to you, it was as if the uh, heavens came and bowed with us as we were lifting up these songs. You know, as we rushed through the room, um, me being mom, I was the last one in the room bringing the boys uh, to see him. And he called out my name. 
uh, with all the strength that he could, uh, Joel, Joel, uh, almost like that Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel, whatever, you know, come, come. And I came and I sat at the edge of his bed and he whispered to me and he asked me if I would sing this song. So on this Greek Orthodox Sunday, this day of celebration, uh, this message that I'm sure we will be blessed to hear from Reverend Pat, I hope this would just put you in the place of your mind and your heart. And until then.
Yeah. <laughs> Praise God and with gratitude. You know, um, so as we all knew, know, we did our journey with Jesus in his last days. And, and last week on Sunday, you know, we, we talked about what it was like for some of the disciples after they realized that their teacher, their rabbi, their master, their friend, their savior was gone. It's gone. We're not there anymore. And, you know, if you had traveled day in and day out with somebody, going through the ups and downs of life, going from town to town, right? You know, bringing healing, uh, being laughed at, being honored, being kicked out, being welcomed, uh, healing, and all of a sudden, that person who you're following, you watched be crucified on the cross. That's, that's a little bit of a mind shift, isn't it? And a heartbreak. And, you know, the thing that happens through the next number of weeks liturgically, and when I say liturgically, meaning that the majority of churches will follow a certain schedule, if you will, of the stories that we tell. And one of the things that we do is we talk about Jesus coming and appearing to many of those who followed him and then even strangers who he had not met. And one of the main things, reasons he did that was to reassure them, to bring them peace, to remind them that it's not the end of the story, that it's not the end of the story, and that death, as painful as it can be, is not the end of the story. Amen? You know, when it was uh, figuring out what did I, how did I want to, you, you know, bring this message to you, I realized what came to me was, was just that, you know, here, here, like I said, for three years, all of this stuff was happening, and, you know, the, the disciples, the apostles, he, he had a really close bond, and then he's gone, and in our lives, how many times in our lives have we had some type of a, kind of a severe break, if you will, with whether it is through death or a loss of a job or loss of a relationship, something that significantly changed in our life where our lives were not the same as they were the day before. Can anybody relate to that one? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And it's in those times, just like the disciples and the apostles, where you're kind of discombobulated. And some of you say, you know, I've been to church every Sunday since I was an infant, and I've been hearing the message, and I've been baptized, I've been born again, I've been confirmed, I've been all of that. But where, oh where, oh where is God now? Amen? Because it is in those times of great despair, of significant shift, that our faith is tested. Right? And how many of us have cried out, Jesus where are you? Where are you, Jesus? Well, sitting around having a, having a, I, we, I, we weren't having dinner yet, or we were having dessert. I was with John and Joel and Ed, who's not here, and we were brainstorming. I was sharing these, I, this idea, and one of, somebody came up with, how many of you remember the song, Believe It or Not, It's Just Me? What, and it's from a sitcom, right? American hero. Okay, so now I'm going to plant that seed. You're going to Google it later. You're going to be reminded of the tune, and you're not going to be able to get it out of your head. I'm not going to sing it, nor will I hum it, but I challenge you to go. <laughs> there we go. Believe it or not, it's just me. Let's give him a hand. Hallelujah. Well, see, so I thought, wouldn't that be a great theme? Think about the times in our lives when we have wanted God, Christ, Holy Spirit to be there, and we can't see, but all of a sudden, through someone or something, we get a, 
Believe it or not, it's me. Right? And these stories that we're going to remember and talk about in the next few weeks, I see it as Jesus going, believe it or not, it's just me. Right? Because I do believe that God is with us in our doubting, that Jesus is still with us, especially in our grief, in our daily lives, when we break bread, when we do the ordinary things of life. Believe it or not, Jesus is there. And so, as one person had, uh, um, had said, when, as they were talking about today, Today, it doesn't matter what year it is. They said, it's the Sunday after Easter. It must be the Doubting Thomas story. And so it is that we're going to have an opportunity to delve into, or at least scratch the surface, of, answer, of seeing that, yes, believe it or not, Jesus is with us in our doubt and our grief. Some of you might go, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about, Pastor? I thought this was Doubting Thomas. Yes. But unlike how many of us have probably learned the story, how many of you did learn the story that Doubting Thomas bad? Because Thomas doubted, Thomas questioned. Have you, any of us heard that? I did as a kid, and I, that's when my rebellion started. I'm serious. I was about this high, maybe. And I was sitting in the pew, and I kept hearing this story year in, year in and year out after Christmas. And when I could understand, when the priest started talking, I was like, wait a minute. I just heard the story told. What's wrong with Thomas? What, I, Honey, I, I'm questioned too. I was not the good little Catholic girl who believed everything that was talk, told to me. Hmm. And then it began. <laughs> But you know, we, especially those of us who were raised Christian, um, you, there's an interesting thing between our Jewish cousins and, uh, and, uh, and us as Christians. In the Jewish faith, it is held up if you question. How many of you remember seeing um, Yentl? Yent, 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 yeah, Bar Barbara Streisand in drag. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> And I'll never forget, remember the scene where they're in rabbinical school or theological school and they're arguing like crazy over, over scripture. They're going back and forth. But, and, well, and, well, and, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're arguing about scripture? Right, because in, in, in many, of, many folks who've been raised in a Christian faith, it's looked down upon if we question, right? Because we should believe what we are told we should believe our priest or our pastor's interpretation, right, of scripture and never think about questioning it. Well, I, I, I believe we have to remember we come from the Jewish faith, if you will, and hold on to and lift up the reality that our faith, our God, this, I will speak for myself, my God is big enough for me to say, what up, right? I, I would say something else, but we're in, <laughs> we're being videotaped and, you know, I never know who watches us and I'm trying to be nice. But really, God is big enough for our questioning. God is big enough for our doubting. God is big enough for our fear and our grief. Amen? Amen. Because I, I, I might shift around. I might shift in my faith. I might shift in my belief. I might shift in my spiritual disciplines. I, I might get into crazy space, you know, where yeah, there was a great, I use Facebook a lot today. There was another one that said, your brain at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? Your brain at 3 a.m. in the morning. But, you know, how many of us wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and then our brain kicks in? Let me tell you about all those issues that you have unresolved. <laughs> Let me tell you what you haven't done yet and the to-do list that's longer than you think it is, right? Yeah, so when I get into that space too, God is steady. I might not be steady, but God is steady. So doubting Thomas, I believe, got a bad rap. 
And you know what? Let's be honest. He wasn't the only one who doubted. If we go back to last week, what was the story? Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she was like, oh my goodness, where is, where is Jesus? And she met the gardener, you know, and she's like, what have you done with, with my master? Where did he go? What did you do with him? And then he said, Mary. And she knew who it was. It was Jesus. And she went running to the other apostles saying, guess what, guess what? I've seen him. I've seen him. He's alive. He's alive. And what did the apostles do? Yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) They did not believe her. They did not believe her. So they went and had to see for themselves that the tomb was empty. And, and, and when we hear the beginning of this reading, we don't hear about, now remember, some of them real, had realized that Jesus had resurrected. He was not in that tomb anymore. And some of them might have actually believed Mary that he was resurrected and alive. But they weren't having a celebration in that upper room. No, they had the door locked and they were in fear. They were in fear when Jesus appeared to them. So, you know, when it comes to Thomas the following week, why on earth have, theologically, we become so hard on him? You know, the other guys, they questioned. They doubted. Jesus had to, like, come on in and go, hello, (laughs) for them to realize, oh, my goodness, our master, our Lord, our teacher, our rabbi is alive. And so Thomas, he too, did, quite frankly, what is normal. But I think there's something deeper in the story that I want us to also see, acknowledge, and embrace. What are some of the stages of grief? It's one of the first stages, of this, according to um, could the Kubler-Ross theory, right? What's one of the first things? No. Denial. 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 I believe personally that Thomas was in denial, that his beloved, beloved Jesus was gone. I believe he was grieving. I believe that he was in a midst of grief and of, of sadness and disbelief, that it didn't matter what his friends told him that Jesus was alive, he was like, no, 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 I saw him die. He can't. What, he had that, cogn- that dissonance going on. I believe he was having all of these emotions, and he needed to see for himself. That doesn't make him bad. That makes him honest. That makes him honest. And so what did Jesus do? Did Jesus say, ha, how dare you? No. He came to him with the others and said, it's me. Touch, feel, put your hands, it's me. And then what did Thomas do? He was the first to proclaim, by the way, my master, my Lord, after when he saw him. And not only that, this man who, it, it, I see him as the pragmatist, right? How how many of us would think of ourselves as being pragmatic, right? I I actually am one of those people that I'm a little cynical. I question. I use Snopes.com. But if you can show it to me, if you can prove it to me, if I can, if I can believe it, if I can see it, touch it, we have a conversation, etc. If I can come to the point of realizing, oh, okay, what you're talking about, there's some truth there. Or if it's something that I strongly believe in, I'll, I'll embrace it. Not only will I embrace it, I'll be a vanguard for talking about it. And that's who and what Thomas was. Thomas was like you and me, a man in grief, Somebody who doubted, who questioned, who wondered, where was his beloved, beloved friend now? And Jesus was there. Jesus was 
there. And that, for us, I believe, in this day and age when there is so much to doubt, so much to wonder, so much that many of us grieve and deny, it is really important for us to realize that God has not forsaken us. God has not forsaken us. Amen? We might be on shifting sand, but God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit is not. Amen? Sometimes and oftentimes when we get off balance, discombobulated, I guess that's the new word, I said it twice, if we get off our center, we often think God is off center as well. But friends, these stories, your, our faith reminds us, and it's something that I truly want us to hold on to, that it is in those times Jesus is still there. Sometimes Jesus needs to show up in physical form. Sometimes it's through a phone call from a friend. So, have any of us had those experiences? Have any of us at certain times in our life really needed the sign? Right? God, give me the sign. I don't have some pithy comeback on an example of a sign at the moment, but, you know, they happen. I've heard them happen. It's happened in my own life, where all of a sudden a coincidence happens, right? Coincidences, by the way, in my opinion, are when God acts anonymously. When we ask for a sign, and there it is. Or maybe it's nothing quite so dramatic. Maybe it's that quiet stirring in our heart. Maybe it's the embrace of a loved one. Maybe it's singing a song and remembering. And in those times, we remember that God is still with us. Believe it or not, Jesus is with us in our doubt and in our grief. You know, Thomas, he was called the twin. It's never quite revealed who he was a twin of. Some people believe that he maybe, I don't believe this one, that maybe he was Jesus' twin, but I don't think that there's a, enough solid basis for that. But there is, there, there, it is recorded that, you know, they kind of looked a little alike and they were on the same wavelength and they were really tight. They were really tight. And in fact, while John often says that he is, you know, the beloved, Thomas he, he was of the ilk that he really couldn't live without Jesus. You know, when, when, when Jesus said, when Lazarus, he was called to go and raise Lazarus, you know, everyone else is like, mm, yeah, I don't know about that. But Thomas is the one, yes, let us go with you, even if we ourselves die with you. And he meant it. Unlike Peter, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, I'll never, I'll never betray you. Mm-hmm. Cock-a-doodle-doo, what happened three times, right? But Thomas, Thomas, they say, he probably sounds like he was a little melancholy. He was pragmatic. He was so committed to Jesus. Somebody shared with me, and I think there could be truth in this. How on earth, Jesus, could you have appeared to them and not me first? Right? Because they were tight. If he was a twin of somebody, he could have been a twin with Matthew because they're always talked about together. Uh, he could have even have been, um, as I said, you know, the, uh, the BFF, one of the BFFs of Jesus. Tight. Kind of acting like a twin. But whoever he was, I like to think that he's our twin. He's our twin. Thomas can be our twin because he lived and he acted and he reacted the way that I think a lot of us really would. A lot of us probably do. And when something horrific happens and a loss happens, when grief happens, I don't know about y'all, but I kind of go into a cave. I, I, I'm a mess. Um, uh, it, it takes a lot to bring me back out. You better prove it to me that you mean it. I think the other part is Jesus, quite frankly, I mean, excuse me, Thomas, quite frankly, 
I think there was another part of him that he didn't want to believe that Jesus was still alive because he didn't want to get his heart broken again. If he was as close as we think that he was to Jesus, imagine if his hopes came back up that Jesus wasn't just dead anymore, that he had resurrected. If he went so far as to believe that Jesus was with him, just like he is with you and me today, he wanted to make sure. He wanted to make sure. And so as we are, are into our world this day and age, I, I think we are in a time of doubt. I think for many of us, the world is a place of shifting sand. Many of the things we took for granted aren't true anymore. Or maybe things that always have been have just simply been revealed. You know, the divisions between people and classes and races and ages, etc. The divisions politically, etc. Who knows if it was Russian bots that did it or if it was always there and, and, and a, and a band-aid or a scab was taken off oozing wounds. But either way, a sense of stability isn't really existent right now. Amen? You know, who knows what's going to happen to the stock market? Who knows what's going to happen to jobs? Who knows what's going to happen with health care? Who knows, right? You know, they, there's actually now therapists even have a, you know, they're, they're acknowledging that there's a, a great amount of of doubting and of grief and of anxiety that's going on in our world. But friends, now as well as the week after Jesus died, there is one thing that's the same. Jesus still is. Jesus is still with us. God has never left us. And the Holy Spirit still speaks to us. I believe that in this moment of time, many of us in our relationships with one another and with the greater world, oftentimes are in this shifting sand. We are like Thomas, we are confused, we are in pain, we are in grief, we are in doubt. You know, God, where are you? Why aren't things the same? Well, because they're not. But instead of projecting upon to God that God has left us, I want to challenge us to project and to embrace that God can be our rock and our foundation. Amen? That in, these, in any times, in the times that we are going through, personally, politically, community-wise, world-wise, with families, that if I think, I believe that we have replaced God with fear. That the fear has been bigger than our faith sometimes. And I want us completely to realize that in this moment of time, believe it or not, Jesus is still with us. Jesus is still with us. It is okay to doubt. It is okay to grieve. It is okay to be in pain. But not to allow that to blind us to what I believe is truth. And the truth of the matter is, is even in our midst of our confusion and the midst of our doubt, I ask you, if you have to, Put your holes in the wounds. But friends, Jesus is still with us. Amen? Amen. So this week, may we go forth and may we be okay with our doubts. May we be okay with our confusion, our discombobulation, word for the week. And remember in those times, believe it or not, it's just Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 How many people knew that God's eye is on the sparrow, right? The Bible says that God takes care of the birds and he takes care of the flowers in the field. 
We're never without food. And as Reverend Pat just said, he's with us in our doubt and our fear. Please join me in seeing God's eye is on the sparrow.
So friends, God does watch over us in all ways and in all times. And this is the opportunity that ushers will pass the baskets to receive not only your financial gifts given from joy, but also your prayer and your praises. Because indeed, God watches over us and God will answer prayers. This I do believe. So let's please allow ourselves to give freely. together in a doxology. <clears throat> Amen, indeed. Friends, as we bless these gifts, we ask, indeed, God, that you look down upon us with good favor and, and bless these gifts that we have given from our hearts, that, indeed, they might be able to be used to continue to the foundation of this church, to be that ministry for those who are seeking and in need, as well as those who are celebrating and being filled with joy. I ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we sit on ourselves and lift up our hearts in the prayers that we have received. And we're on prayer that God will melt the hearts of, uh, will melt hearts. My brother and sister-in-law will get to see their granddaughter from Tom Allard. Thanks uh, for me reuniting with my old MCC friends, and thanks to Reverend Pat, and thanks to God. Uh, from Leah, please, signs of guidance, clear signs of guidance. From uh, Luis, uh, from my friend Eli, for a new job, uh, for, for uh, being able to let go of some people in my life that are really not friends. And, Anonymous, a, a prayer for Tim. Prayer for Tim. And I'd also like to add prayer, travel mercies for my dad, who is driving down here as we speak. Um, that the drive is safe and uneventful, and our visit is is a uh, joy to vote. Also, uh, prayers for two of our sister churches. One for Founders MCC, yeah. as this is their weekend that they candidate uh, Reverend Keith Mazingo as their new senior pastor. And also prayers for Christ Chapel in Santa Ana, our MCC there. They were broken into over this weekend, and um, many things were stolen, um, not just uh, things as such as TVs, um, but also uh, things that are of deep sentimental value. Um, so for that uh, church and their pastor. Uh, prayers also for Kim, Kim and Mary Jo. Uh, Kim is not well today, and thus they can't be here, but she asked for prayers for breathing. She's having issues with breathing. And um, huge praises for my young nephew, Ronan McDonough, for this is his celebrating today his first Holy Communion uh, with his, the rest of his family in Colorado. Um, it's the uh, first, uh, yeah, let's give him a hand. He's uh, seven, I think, and he's actually been asked to do the reading as well as he has. Wow. 
big thing for Auntie, so I just asked that we <laughs> And uh, also, um, <coughs> prayers of uh, praises that uh, my healing and recovery continue. Yes. And uh, also, uh, that I'm well enough, and uh, speaking of travel mercies, uh, that uh, Ron and I are going on a 15-day uh, cruise. So you won't see us for the next three Sundays, but it's for a good reason. <laughs> Well, first of all, to survive and be with you all, but also to just have the, the wonderful, you know, sense of, of, of abundance that is all wonderful things. So thank you for that. And of course, for all our congregants facing challenges, God, may your presence and strength be known. And as these spoken prayers, as we offer these spoken prayers, we assure that you know the, the particular concerns that lie heaviest in our hearts and minds. Receive these our silent prayers as we offer them to you. Now, please join me in the communion responses. God is with you. And also with you. Let us lift up our hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give God thanks and praise. It is a good and joyful thing to do. We thank you, God, that from the very beginning, you promised us peace. Despite turning our backs, you have worked to unlock the hardness of our hearts. You covenanted with us, calling us to lives of compassion and care. So, God, we thank you and join the choirs of angels in singing your holiness. Santo, 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 mi corazón te ora, mi corazón te salve, sí, Santo eres Dios. Holy, holy, holy. You sent Jesus as an embodiment of your presence. He incarnated a message of love, provoking us to look at ourselves as you see us. Jesus dared to dream of, to dream of a world where your love presided, where all peoples are welcomed as children at your table. Despite gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, or ethnicity, where the least are the greatest embodying a dangerous memory of your unconditional love for all. And with courage, Jesus stood in Jerusalem to proclaim that love was greater than ritual, compassion more important than fundamentalist religion, and peace stronger than terror. And on the night before he died, Jesus gathered his friends together for a meal, an inclusive table for all, not just the 12, but for all, as a symbol for that we too are part of this common union, this communion. And he took bread into his hands. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to those at the table saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do likewise in memory of me when you serve. Yes. And in a similar fashion, he took the cup from the table, he asked blessings upon it, and as he shared it with those who were gathered there, as it is shared with you and with me this day, here, take and drink of this cup, for into it is poured forth my blood, my life essence, all of who I am. I ask you drink, you drink fully, and you drink often, and when you do so, remember me. Like the beloved disciple, and yes, the doubting Thomas, we stood at the foot of the cross and watched you die. But we hoped that God's reign would prevail, that life would triumph over death, peace over violence, and love over hate. 
Like Mary Magdalene, we carried myrrh and aloe to the tomb, intending to anoint the broken body of Jesus. We searched for you, Jesus. We longed for your presence, but found the tomb empty. However, you came to us still. With Mary, you said, why are you weeping? To Thomas, you said, touch my hands. You reminded us that you never left us. So bless us as a beloved community, hoping, longing, searching, believing, and loving. Give us the Holy Spirit to keep your message alive with ourselves and our church. Make us agents of transformation. This we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, in the power of the Spirit. Amen. 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 And friends, let us join together in singing the prayer that Jesus gave to us. consecrated elements to which you might go at any time, if you so choose, just to receive between you and God. But friends, let's keep this feast prepared by all that is holy for us to receive. May the ushers guide us and servers in that place.
today we as always receive it for those who could not be here for those who were inside that room and locked it so tight that they could not get out may we remind them that Jesus can still come in and we receive this with them Friends, we have received. I hope we've been blessed. I hope that we take the message out and spread it to the world. Most of all, 
Mr. Rises, we're able to celebrate with one another in our closing song. that we go forth and we just bring with us the blessings that have been bestowed upon each and every one of us. May we go forth with peace. Peace be with us all, no matter where we are. And may we continue to go and grow with God. May we go in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen.